Hello everyone, I'm Aditi and I'm going to be your host for today. So let's start with our first speaker, Ajayta Shah Ma'am. Ajayta Ma'am is the founder of Frontier Markets and the president of Frontier Innovations Foundation. Frontier Markets is a rural marketing, sales and service distribution company providing access to affordable and quality solar solutions to low-income households in India. She has been working in India for 10 years in microfinance and clean energy distribution. She has won many influential awards along her journey, such as Social Entrepreneur of the Year in Forbes 30 Under 30 and others. Now I'll request ma'am to continue with our session. Uh, thank you so much, Aditi, for the introduction. Uh, just uh, two quick clarifications. So I actually probably started working in India uh, at a younger age than most of you on this call. I was around 20 and now I'm 35. So it's actually been 15 years of working in India in rural distribution um, and microfinance and clean energy. Um, and also um, uh, I'll definitely be spending uh, some time talking about uh, what Frontier Markets does as a company. Um, and I'll, I'll give the updates there. But I also really wanted to thank um, Anjali and just generally um, the IIEE group. Um, it's very exciting for me to be a part of a webinar, um, getting a chance to um, see so many young students and that two women students coming together that are in engineering and are thinking about uh, their futures and their role in contributing to uh, the work and also, most importantly, the impact that they can create when it comes to uh, India. Um, as you can imagine, I mean, we are in a very uh, interesting time period, right, as a nation, but also as a world, where on the one hand, we are battling uh, a massive health crisis. On the other hand, we are also seeing uh, a reality of climate uh, change and climate injustice. Um, on the third hand, we're also watching about how vulnerabilities like healthcare, climate disasters always end up um, affecting uh, the people that are the most vulnerable or the poor. And we're starting to see a massive spiral reality effect um, in this process. And, you know, the impact of COVID and the impact of, of climate change and the impact of poverty, as we can imagine, doesn't single out individuals, it happens on a massive scale. But it also makes us probably wonder that as the youth, as individuals coming together and thinking about our future, where do we take our studies, our privilege, our education, our mindset and our opportunity, and most importantly, our age, um, because it's open for a lifetime of experiences, how do we best apply these opportunities to come back a lot of the challenges that we see in front of us. So I'm gonna spend some time uh, telling you a little bit about you know, my journey in making this thing happen um, and wanting to really uh, connect with all of you to really um, take the time to give you an example of what can one do when they start recognizing uh, their role in this world as a student, as a woman, as a educated person with an opportunity to solve big problems. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the perspective of rural India? How do you take the concept of wanting to create impact, but at the same time also wanting to build a career or a business opportunity? How do you combine the two to create something called a social enterprise? Um, and I'll give you the example of Frontier Markets in more detail. Um, and then I'd love to take the time to talk to you about opportunities that are out there that you can be a part of and how we at Frontier Markets are kind of designing it. And I wanna make sure that I'm keeping more than 10 minutes of time to really um, you know, open this as questions for all of you, uh, especially because we're not a large group. Um, and I'm always curious to understand how you, especially as students right now, are thinking about your own roles and your own journeys and where do you see your fitment into really solving larger problems, creating bigger ideas, thinking through innovation, the role that engineering, technology, and data can play in solving all of this at once. So to start off with, I'm going to share my screen and just let me know if this works. 
Can everyone see my screen right now, my PowerPoint presentation? Yes, ma'am, we can see it. Okay, great, fantastic. Okay, so um, let me give you a quick brief about myself. So um, you can tell by my accent, um, I wasn't necessarily born in India, but my family is originally from Rajasthan. In fact, we have 300 years of uh, heritage, culture, and experience based out of Jaipur. But my parents, uh, they were Jaipur Jain jewelers. I used to like calling it the triple J threat. Um, they moved to the United States um, in the 1980s. So I was first born um, American, uh, Indian child in uh, the US. Now, what I used to always joke around around about was that, you know, while Jaipur in India might have been moving forward, when you're born into a Jaipur Jain jeweler family in New York, you're actually living in a time capsule. So growing up as a girl, growing up in that kind of community, I both was very extremely a part of a very conservative society. I learned how to read, write in Hindi. I learned Kathak. I learned how to like cook. I, and you know, my parents always told me the most important thing in my life is to educate as a hobby and then eventually get ready for marriage. And imagine this living in New York. Now in parallel, I also of course was exposed to the American culture. So I, you know, was a debater in high school. I learned about policy debate. I got trained in mediation and conflict resolution. I did study abroad. I spent time working in Congress. I spent time really starting to learn about what I wanted to learn in terms of my role as an individual, as a global citizen, and what does it mean to be educated, but then also understand the concept of the culture and society that we live in. And really, uh, right after I graduated from college, I basically fibbed, fibbed to my parents. I lied to my parents and I told them that I wanted to take one year off to move to come back to India for a fellowship and uh, spend 10 months working in a concept called microfinance. Um, and just to take a year off before I would go back to law school, become a typical lawyer, you know, start working for a New York law firm. And then, you know, very nicely by the age of 24, 25, get an arranged marriage, get married, have kids and do all the things that I'm supposed to do. And of course, um, that one decision to uh, uh, be a part of this fellowship, which basically meant I, you know, got a stipend of 20,000 rupees. I lived in Bangalore and I worked for a startup microfinance organization called Ujivan Financial Services, which many of you probably have heard of today because now it's a massive bank. But back then it was a startup, not even three branches old. And I spent 10 months just wanting to learn about microfinance and try to understand my role in the world. And to be honest, that changed my life. Um, it was the first time that I was getting an opportunity to truly understand uh, India and its complexities, um, understand the challenges and realities of vulnerable communities, but also linked to business opportunities and really got excited to come in as like a young fresher and just absorb learnings from the field and all different various levels uh, of, of experiences with mentors and colleagues. And frankly speaking, that one year became eight I started working for all different kinds of microfinance organizations. I lived and worked in over 10,000 plus villages across. I launched really big initiatives in the microfinance sector, won a lot of awards, as Aditi mentioned, and eventually set up Frontier Markets. And, you know, I never planned this. I had no idea that this was going to be my journey. And you can imagine my parents getting super confused and scared about what this ledki is trying to do. But, you know, that's life for us, right? We are very interesting people. And especially us at our age and our opportunity. On the one hand, we are sitting in the most exciting country on earth, India, that has the most complex problems, but also the most interesting opportunities. We are also women that are at an age at a time we have to ask ourselves, are we going to be more than what our traditions tell us to be? Are we supposed to be valued in a different way? And third, most importantly, we are here with the opportunity of leveraging education and creating innovation to really solve big opportunities. And so uh, by 2011, I, um, I learned so much in the, in the seven years that I was working uh, with other organizations and learning from my peers. And I was always enamored and caught up by the humility of rural families. You know, um, rural India today to me is the most important area uh, or important population of any region of the world. 
It's one of the largest, right? We're talking about 700 million plus people. And in microfinance, I spend a lot of time getting to know them, getting to know families, getting to know their challenges, getting to know their realities. And in that journey of working with microfinance and delivering financial services and creating business opportunities, I was really humbled by the idea of doing something bigger and beyond financial services, wanting to really bring true access to rural families. And I decided to take a chance at Frontier Markets. So let me tell you what Frontier Markets is, right? So I call Frontier Markets an access company. Our goal as a company is to connect Bharat's rural customers to India's products and services. And looking at the context of India again, I mean, let me give you some numbers, right? And I don't know how well, how, how well versed everybody is on this call. So India today has 700 million people that are more or less a part of rural India. Yeah. Even the rural India construct, there are some people that are better off and some people that are not. And if I look at the 700 million people that are living in rural India, there are over 680, 551 million people out of those 700 million that are absolutely still not accessing quality service and goods at the doorstep of where they live. That's 165 million households in India. And if you look at that benchmark of those half a million people, and if you look at it even further and look at it almost at 600 plus million people, 394 million of them are rural women. Rural women who are driving get income generating opportunities to build agency and build power to be able to drive changes in their communities. And when we saw this as a big challenge, we decided to create a solution that was going to be something that was going to be um, locally infused, linked with technology innovation, and driving value and services. So we came in with a lens of a couple of things that we believe in. One, rural households, though poor or though not as privileged as I am, are still the most valuable community in India because they are the largest. Rural households are still need to be treated as dignified customers because ultimately they have income, they have aspiration, they want to purchase things, they are learning and earning and driving incomes and systems. And if we actually convert their challenges into opportunities, create a market or a business opportunity that can create scale. Third, we believed that women were the key to driving change in any rural village. Because if you started recognizing the challenges that rural households were facing, access to electricity, access to clean water, access to healthcare services, access to internet, access to mobile devices, access to quality regular appliances, access to daily services meeting at my doorstep. All of these different basic access to reality things that all of us actually purchase can become a market opportunity. But the key is to have women help you drive an understanding between who that rural customer is, who that household is, what do they want, what do they need, how do we do a better job creating a partnership with them to actually deliver those services on the ground. So on that part, we also believe that not just rural women are the key to make this thing happen. We also believe that the only way to truly create a proper business is when you recognize who your customer is and you with your customer to understand them and build solutions around them. So you must have all heard of human-centered designing or customer-centric thinking. Imagine this created as Interesting. We just knew if we talk to a understand and we deliver, we create solutions around. So locally, we partnered local NGOs who were physically working deeply in rural villages. Rural villages that we're talking about that literally have maximum 150 houses. Families are agri families. Mostly, they're also people that are migrant laborers. Um, typically, every family, about 80% of them, are participating in a government uh, initiative called the Self-Hub Group. And they essentially are not even connected to your local shops and definitely not connected to the Amazons of the world or the Samsungs of the world or the customer service centers of the world. However, the value part of this group and community was that they were earning income. They did want to invest in their children's futures. They did want to have better income opportunities and jobs, and they wanted to use their money 
to get the same kind of products and services that have been available in urban India. So we partnered with those NGOs to get access to these rural villages. And we started recruiting women through the self-help groups. We started identifying rural women that were living in these villages, and we started giving them training to basic systems on sales, marketing, after sales service, digital literacy. We gave them access to smartphones. We gave them access to internet. And we also co-created a technology solution. We created an e-commerce platform that allowed us to enable these women to actually become assisted e-commerce delivery solutions for their rural customers. They started reaching out to their neighbors, started collecting data, started showcasing products, and started helping create demand, which was then supported by our customer service centers that are located in these actual uh, uh, small uh, blocks, which was covering 100 villages. And imagine delivery people that are doing doorstep delivery in these villages, doing all different kinds of products and services, based on the demand that's there. And imagine all of this is being driven by technology for the purpose of data collection, right? Learning about my customers as deeply as possible. People want, why are they gonna buy it? Building credit of my rural women, giving them an opportunity to prove that they're business savvy and creating a history for them. Packing all of my understanding of products, service and marketing on knowledge on a data center and using that to make better decisions. So curated products and services at scale. What kind of products have we introduced? So in the last five years in Rajasthan only, we started off with clean energy services. So as Aditi mentioned, that we've been known for solar products. And I agree, that's what we've been known for for a very long time. But actually that's changed. So for since 2011, we started with one mission, we said, we need to drive better access to reliable electricity to rural households, and we, in, we introduce solar products. Eventually, these solar products were not, they were purchased by other big manufacturers. But when we started building partnerships with rural customers, we actually started um, designing a lot of these product solutions with Indian manufacturers that were co-designed with our rural customers. So those are solar lighting systems, clean cook stoves, appliances. But eventually, as time changes, and if you, if you guys have seen, in India, the government and a lot of initiatives have changed in the last three years, right? Indian government brought in a lot of electrification missions, right? Today, villages are no longer 0% electrified. They have anywhere between 12 and 18 hours of electricity, and it's also 24 by 7. So all of a sudden, with the times changing, customers' demand started changing as well. Rural customers didn't just want solar products. They wanted appliances. They wanted TVs, refrigerators, washing machines, mixers, bl blenders, irons, smartphones, Bluetooth speakers. They wanted internet access. They wanted financial services. And they also wanted agri-tools. So Frontier Markets went from being a quote-unquote solar access company to leveraging its technology and its data to becoming an everything company. So today, we actually sell and create products and services across all different types of categories, recognizing the needs and wants of our customers. We operate in four states of India. We have over 700,000 household families that we work with. We have 20 customer service centers. We've built 4,000 women entrepreneurs who earn today money. And this is really important, right? It's not just about skilling rural women and you know, doing charity. It's about recognizing that if you're creating a business, everybody in the value chain needs to be incentivized. So rural women today are earning on average anywhere between 35,000 to 65,000 rupees a year. That's four times any income they've ever heard, earned in a grant-driven or project-driven model. And the reality is when these women earn money, massive agency gets created. Women with money are confident, they're also the key drivers of creating services in their communities. Because of them, their rural households have access to all kinds of products and services at a convenience. And that's why they have a reputation. They have respect. And when they earn money, guess what they invest in? They invest in their girl child's education. They stop child marriages, right? They focus on private education. They focus on healthcare. So you see exponential impact that gets created. We have 125 employees. 70% of our, 80% of our employees are actually field staff. These are locally recruited rural villagers that we're giving job opportunities to. 
And in our head office, almost 60% of our staff are young women. We strongly believe on a gender lens. We believe it's really important to look at the opportunity for women to leverage their assets, their empathy, their understanding of market, their ability to communicate, their passion and drive to work, and the discipline that's there. And we've done this profitably. So, you know, we've created massive amounts of impact in rural communities when it comes to women, when it comes to end customers. But we've also created real business opportunities. And we've had all different kinds of investors. We've been globally known. And we've been able to do this by earning income for the company as well as creating value for our employees and create career opportunities for their future. I'm giving you a simple idea of what an e-commerce platform looks. If you see this over here, this was literally designed by Sahelis. So imagine sitting in a room with rural women that are telling you what they need and you are then using your UX UI design skills, your technology skills, your coding skills, your data skills, and you're designing with rural women to create value at an exponential scale. And this is the beauty of what we see as an innovation going forward, right? All the youth in the world that are thinking through technology, that are thinking through data, et cetera. Imagine working with your strongest counterpart that is the rural women or the rural villagers themselves and designing to create product innovation and, pro and, and progress. We then designed delivery apps. Today, all of us are used to Amazon. All of us are used to, we know of Misho, we know of Shiro's, we know of Swiggy, we know of Zomato. Have any of you heard of these people being able to reach a rural woman and using her to actually sell doorstep delivery services to villages at scale. And that is where the hybrid innovation comes in. When you're working with the ground for so many years, and then you're starting to bring in technology and innovation to scale. A lot of you on this call might be data scientists or looking to become data analytics or thinking about data engineering. So imagine what happens in a rural context when you're able to start thinking through all the data that can come in. Today, imagine getting 750,000 rural people to give you 25 to 30 different types of variables of data, and you are getting an opportunity to use your data obsession to do analysis, cleaning, and also think through patterns and innovations of what can come next in the future. And again, it also opens an opportunity to innovate, even when there are times of crisis, right? When COVID hit in March, 23rd. You know, Frontier Markets was one of the first companies that did not fully shut down. In fact, we stayed open because we got government permits to be able to deliver essential goods to rural villages because they saw value in our infrastructure and our technology. When you have technology, when you have physical people on the ground, when you have access to community, you are actually able to further innovate. We literally converted all of our teams into call center people. And imagine 123 people talking to 4,000 Sahelis who have access to at least 100 customers each and asking them real time, what are the gaps in your villages? What is going on? Today, we talk about what's going on in Bangalore, what's going on in Delhi, what's going on in Jaipur. Who's talking about what's going on in Samula village in Alwar? Right? Who's talking about what's going on in Rajgad in Dolpur? Who's talking about these rural villages where reality checks are very different? And imagine getting real-time realities to understand the challenges and get an opportunity to quickly innovate. And that's exactly what we did. We created a new technology tool that was meant for our rural customers. So our Sahelis, these are women that were being told that right? right? Because of social distancing. So we created a WhatsApp level e-commerce platform for rural customers to connect and give their information. We also learned that rural customers were not being able to access their bank accounts. So a lot of you have heard about fintech companies, right? You've heard about digital banking. When demonetization happened, right? That was a big thing that everybody was talking about. Right, Tata's talk about, Infosys talks about the next half a billion customers that they want to bring into digital banking solutions. Imagine that not being possible if a rural customer does not have the right cell phone or the right Aadhaar card or the right code or the right access to their bank account because they cannot physically travel. Where does Frontier Markets come in as innovation? Frontier Markets started partnering with a lot of these fintech companies to say, can we deliver this service through our Sahelis at a doorstep level? Can we reach the rural customer 
where they live and help them withdraw their cash physically from their homes as if it's a mobile ATM. And just in 20 days, imagine in 20 days, we onboarded 2,000 more women using virtual tools. We started getting 10,000 plus customers to start using a B2C e-commerce platform. We introduced over 140 new products for essential goods and deliveries to create impact in response to COVID. Over 15,000 plus deliveries have been happening on a weekly basis to serve rural communities and tracking the data and outcomes. And over 13,000 people have already gone from being cash dependent to becoming cashless. And this is the excitement that comes in when you think about where you can take access to rural, a challenge, and look at innovation and look at co-creation and create value at a very large level. And this, on a business perspective, creates even more excitement. So where we are today, when a lot of organizations are worrying about not being able to survive because of COVID, we are some of the few companies that are thinking about where we're going to thrive because of COVID, where our innovation and our work on creating value for rural households can become a scaled opportunity and take it to the next level. And where can we start partnering with government, with NGOs, and other places to create business opportunities and value and impact at the same time. And so what's the next era? And, you know, given that you guys are all, you know, kind of techie engineers and uh, folks of that space, I should tell you that that's really not my background at all. So I respect you a lot. But I recognize the value of what you all are doing and where the opportunity is. Now more than ever, everybody that wants to survive in creating value, creating business, creating opportunities needs to digitize. So even we are now thinking about even further levels of digitization. We want to recognize the role that we can play in rural communities to bring in more digital opportunities, right? Creating more digital marketing tools, creating more digital centered products and services, creating more digital innovation on data, and eventually being able to understand what the role that of AI and machine learning can actually play. And what's really exciting is all the innovators that are out there today are all waiting to enter into rural India and we could become the key. And so, you know, I wanted to end my talk and I really wanted to stop over here and like I said, give an ample amount to ask just overall questions for everyone. You can ask me any questions, right? You can ask me questions about my journey. You can ask me questions about our business. You can ask me questions about learnings. You can even tell me about what you all are thinking about when it comes to what you're excited about. And before we do that, I wanted to close with an opportunity. So when Anjali had asked me to do this, I said that, you know, I will say yes, because I'm excited to see whether there are people that are listening to this webinar today who are excited to understand what their next step is. So we recognize that because of COVID, there have been over 120 million plus jobs that have been lost, right? The unemployment rate is at its lowest. A lot of students that should have been technically graduating and getting job placements did not get their job offers, right? A lot of people are sitting remotely from their homes and don't even know when they're getting back to school. Now, in this time, the question that we keep asking the youth that are saying that I don't want to sit at home and do nothing. I want to actually continue learning. I want to continue to be involved. I want to create value. My purpose of going through education is not to sit at home and do nothing. I want to do something. So we decided to get, in, we were inspired by them and we decided to then open a fellowship. So we started a fellowship that is very specifically designed for those students that are excited about engineering, technology, and data. And we wanted to open an opportunity for them to get experience and what would it look like to work in some of these areas in the rural context, in rural markets, in looking at women empowerment and looking at impact and looking at value. So this um, data and technology fellowship is something that we just launched. Uh, it's a rolling thing that we're looking at wanting to introduce. We're opening it to a lot of different students um, who have some sort of experience in data or technology or Excel or coding or something or the other. Um, and the idea is that you can work with us either remotely or in Rajasthan, in Jaipur with us, depending on when travel will be safe. But the idea is that we would love to mentor you, give you access to field experiences, give you design projects with you, and actually work with you to really help you understand the value of your learnings and your teachings and how you can apply that to create impact. 
And we would love to then help you get placed into other jobs, other opportunities, or possibly work with Frontier Markets. And I wanted to open this as an opportunity for this audience specifically. And again, you can ask me any more detailed questions about this as well. But the whole idea here is that this is a really important time to recognize that across the world we are seeing that women are becoming the force of leadership. Women are instrumental in actually looking at partnerships and creating value and looking at their education and their opportunities to really become something. And this is a really interesting time to recognize that all of us sitting in this room today, men or women, are here because we are interested in wanting to understand what our role is in the next five years to come. And how can we collectively work together to design a beautiful outcome to make that happen? So I'm gonna stop over here to see whether or not there are questions. Oh, great. So we have questions on the side. Excellent. Hello, so I'm just gonna start. Questions yeah. for you. Aditi, would you like to curate uh, so it? The first question is. Yeah. How was your experience on establishing local connection with communities in rural areas? Sure. So, um, so the, uh, the context here is that we've always worked with um, nonprofits. So these are nonprofits that have been established through Tata Trust or established through the government or established through Nabard that's been working in a specific rural community area for many, many years. So I'll give you an example. Uh, there's an organization that I'm sure many of you have heard of called Pradhan. Pradhan has had, has, has had its operations in Dholpur, which is one of the districts in Rajasthan that we operate in, deeply embedded into these rural communities, literally for 15 plus years, where they've established their social positioning, they've established their local connect to the community, and they've created all these self-help groups. So we first partner with the NGO. Why does the NGO want to partner with us? Because the NGO recognizes that we both have uh, a common uh, goal of impact where we want to create value for rural families. We want to create income opportunities for women. Where we respect the NGO is that they've established a social connect and a trust in that community. Where they respect us is that we've come in with a business model with products and services and a delivery system that can create sustained value on the ground. And by partnering with the NGO, that is actually how we first enter into these villages. So the NGO gives us access to a lot of data. They give us access to a, a lot of deep understanding in terms of the dynamics of all these villages. And then even the first time that we're entering into these villages, we go through the NGO. So we do recruitment activities. We do a lot of events. We talk about the value. So it's an entire process. We never come into these villages on our own. We always come in through a partner. Um, and if you're at, so, and that's where the local connections really got it started. Um, this also comes from, honestly, my own personal experiences. I mean, when I worked in any of the organizations that I've worked with, I've worked with Ujivan, I've worked with Bandhan, I've worked with SKS, I've worked with Basics. And, you know, when you're coming there, the, the fundamental point is when you're whenever you're establishing any connection with any rural community it's honesty it's context and it's clarity of communication like i honestly was my i was the first saheli of my own organization i set up the first branch in rajasthan in chomu and i physically would literally go into these villages leveraging a microfinance meeting or a self-help group meeting and i would very honestly introduce myself and i would honestly connect to a lot of the realities that I knew that were not uncommon, right? When I talk about electricity as a challenge, or when I talk about the, the hardness of kerosene, or when I talk about the struggles that women have, these are real things, right? These are not made up stories. So it, it is about establishing a contextual connect with that rural family, which is honest, and you're coming in to actually establish a value. But to be fair, the only way to truly deliver that is when you're partnering locally with someone that has trust in that community already, which is why that Saheli, the woman that we recruit, is so important. She's known in the community, right? She can enter into any household. She is the person that helps me honestly build a strong connection with the rural community that I can leverage to take it forward. Okay. 
so our next question is um, how to generate new ideas so the best way to generate new ideas is to spend time in the field and ask customers right that's the best way so on a regular basis we always um, you know every every single moment of our work and operations if you look at our entire team structure we're constantly engaging our rural customers and our sahelis to understand three things right do they need something that we already have to offer are they satisfied with what we've given or do they need or want something else or is there another challenge or opportunity that we don't know about that we should be getting uh, information about so we're constantly working with our markets and our rural customers and our sales to understand what are the challenges or the opportunities and then against that we start designing ideas that we co-create with our sahelis and our communities right so even when we were launching financial services which frankly you know um is something that you can you we will not bring in unless it was demanded by our rural customers but you need to truly understand what the pain points were right so rural customers had to tell you you know the problem is not just i don't have financial services the problem is that i cannot go to my bank the problem is that everybody wants to give me low cost financial services but my phone number is is not linked to my aadhaar which is not linked to my janthan yojana bank account so as you started understanding the pain points more deeply then you were able to start generating ideas and then ultimately the other key is to pilot no idea is a good idea when it's established on a piece of paper okay and that's just a reality so you know you cook you 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 work with the communities that you're looking to uh, generate ideas for you co create um pilots you do low cost interventions to test it right so testing is really important because testing will help you either succeed or fail and failing is equally as important as succeeding because failing will teach you what not to do the next time and the more you iterate the more you establish a solid idea that you can then take to scale but the key is to identify the data the gaps etc co creation iteration and then id and then take that ideation to action and then learn from the action before you take it to scale okay so our next question is uh, how much time did it take for you to actually implement this business idea and what steps did you go through wow amruta that's a very uh, loaded question to be honest with you it, it, it it's a it's taken many 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 steps and taken a very long time so i joke around and i say that this is now frontier markets uh, 4.0 right it's a fourth iteration of the company to, we we started our we started our work in 2011 okay um in rajasthan now understand that at that time right the market and the ecosystem was very different there was no space for technology there was no space for you know mo using mobile apps and trying to you know leverage internet right to do work on the ground so everything imagine was paper trail right there was no electricity access there was no 4g connectivity there were no roads so 2011 to 2013 was a very different time right and that was when we were focused on physically doing everything right physically meeting people writing things on a piece of paper right putting it into excel you know a call center was and, and you know rural customers phone numbers changed all the time is prepaid cards there's no such thing as postpaid so you know times changed a lot so frontier markets 1.0 was energy access working on physical deliveries the things that we always have stayed consistent with which was our vision and our mission our mission always was our belief never changed our belief that rural customers were dignified people that deserved high quality products and services delivered to their doorstep we believed in uh uh saral jeevan right creating an easy life by identifying challenges for rural customers and that should be how you decide your product categories and we believe that anything that we introduce to create impact and value we believed in after sale service and we believed in creating partnerships on the ground so that never changed So I'll say that always stayed consistent. What changed was how we did it. So Frontier Markets 1.0 was energy only, no technology, and physical distribution that was working. 2013 to 2015, we added a gender lens, right? And we started diversifying our product basket 
from being other people's energy products to actually creating our own energy solutions. 2015 to 2017, demonetization, I think, changed the world, right? So all of a sudden, we had to really, truly pivot. And we had to pivot from being an energy-only company to starting to think about our role in digitization. And what would 4G connectivity and rural villages do to us? And what would be the role that we would play by bringing in phones into rural villages more effectively? 2018 uh, was all about then. So if 20, uh, 15, uh, 2016 to 2018 was diversification, 2018 to 2019 was digitization, right? Bringing in all technology solutions and also expanding beyond Rajasthan. We started expanding to UP Bihar Orissa. And then COVID happened. So COVID created another level of iteration. So, you know, I always say this, right? You know, uh, how long it takes for something to um, operationalize is a combination of many things, right? It's the political ecosystem, right? It's the market ecosystem. It's the environmental ecosystem. It's your own resilience. It's your access to capital, right? And it's your own access to learnings and, and, and your ability to be resilient and last. So I always say that, you know, like everyone always says, oh, like you're 10 years old, you cannot possibly be a startup. And I said, to be honest with you, I am a startup because Frontier Markets 4.0 is a very different company than what Frontier Markets 1.0 was. And so um, it does take time. I think the key here is to be agile and able to be able to pivot in a way that allows you to be uh, interactive, right? Um, um, Aditya, if you don't mind, I'm, I see the questions on the chat room. So I'm just going to go through it myself, if that's okay. Yeah. So Sayali, your question's next, right? Which is about which areas in India has frontier markets been impact? So we operate in Rajasthan, in Alwar, Dholpur, and Ajmer. Uh, we have 20 branches. So we have operations in 2,000 villages in Rajasthan. And then in UP, Bihar, Orissa, we have about seven branches there. So that's another 700. Uh, uh, so we've got roughly 3,000 villages uh, that we operate in. That's where we have created our zones of work. Um, that was supposed to scale this year to from 3,000 villages to actually 25,000 villages. Uh, but again, COVID uh, hindered our ability to actually start that scale. But the idea was to really go deeper into UP Bihar Orissa this year and then we started creating partnerships with governments to start looking at Jharkha and Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. The goal for us was always identifying rural areas, identifying low income areas and identifying government SAG group partnerships to take to scale. And that's actually the direction we were going into. Um, I'm seeing the question from Mukul, which is the only thing harder than starting a business is to ensure its sustainability in the long run. How do you ensure that? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I agree. Um, um, and I would maybe add to your question, Mukul, the only thing harder than start starting a business is ensuring its sustainability, viability, and impact in the long run. And when you're a social business, it's a much more complicated journey, right? Because you are not trying to cut corners. You're not trying to randomly just create commercial value, right? You are working with vulnerable communities and you're trying to create impact along the way of driving sustainability. And let, let's be clear, you're working with communities that aren't rich, right? They don't have all the money in the world. And frankly speaking, you're also not going to exploit them because you also come with your own set of mission, vision, and values, right? So in the long run, to drive sustainability, it's, it's you know, I mean, to, ask, to answer very logically, it's really closely managing your top line and your bottom line. But also it's about my philosophy, and this is very different from, we're very different from a lot of other companies, is we went deep versus wide. So when you're a social business or even a nonprofit, right, there's always a lot of pressure of scaling your impact. How big can you become? So there's a lot of companies that, you know, in theory are like, yeah, we're in 17 states and we have 70,000 entrepreneurs and, you know, we have all these people. But if you look at their sustainability, they're not even remotely close to their sustainability. They expanded way too fast, created massive, massive overheads and costs, but they never cracked the unit economics, right? They never cracked the actual business model itself. So now you've made something big, but you have no idea how to sustain it. Frontier markets went deep versus wide, right? We've been profitable for the last four and a half years now, right? And we're one of the few companies that despite COVID and despite all the challenges that come with COVID, 
we are actually in business and sustaining and thriving still, right? And a lot of it is because we decided to go through our unit economics, understand our value, go deep versus wide, crack the model, and then take that model to scale. And I think that's very important as you're thinking about how you are trying to understand your targets and your KPIs and your goals as a company. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, um, I'll share my contact details. I, I, I can share my contact details just on um, email uh, on this. Uh, generally speaking, I will request you guys to actually connect on LinkedIn. There's a very specific article that I have written on LinkedIn, which talks about the best way to engage me and Frontier Markets, because ultimately it's really important that you guys do your research. It's really important that you understand and why you're getting in touch with me and what is it that you want because be to be fair i have fifty thousand plus connections on linkedin right we are a global company we have a hundred plus stakeholders and partners we have two million plus customers and on a daily basis you have to recognize there's only 24 24 hours in a day and i do like sleeping for six of them right so 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 be to be fair i openly always tell you guys to get in touch get in touch with me, but please do your research. Please be very specific as to why you're getting in touch, right? Don't give me a generic that I want to get mentored by you. That's not a fair ask because please understand, I have literally 50,000 plus students that are always engaging on a regular basis, right? So let's get targeted and I'd love to then connect you in the right way that I can, but help me help you, right? Effectively, right? That's the goal. Um, Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that we have about five to six more minutes. So I'm just going to quickly look at all the questions and I'm going to try to summarize them quite quickly. Um, do the sales restrict their business? Yeah. Um, how do we apply? I, okay, cool. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of challenges when it comes to digital literacy for rural women. Um, we definitely have been spending a lot of time trying to crack that. Um, you know, um, we have partnered with organizations like the Internet Sati program or the Google uh, Internet Sati program and friends. And so, like, there have been other initiatives that have been trying to, um, you know, do basic digital literacy for women, right? Getting them access to smartphones, getting them access on a basic level. But ultimately, uh, the beauty of how we designed our tech was that our tech came second, right? The work and the training and the understanding of the city came first. When Saheli's co-designed our technology solution, what I mean by that is they literally built it with us. They literally told us what exactly they wanted and how they wanted it and what they would be able to do, um, you know, with, with, um, with, with that solution, right? So we were able to tackle it a little bit, but to be fair, it's still very challenging, right? So we use like a lot of handholding. Um, we have senior Sahelis who've got, done a better job and they're trying to meet other Sahelis to do training better. We also really excitedly are partnering with some AI companies that are now creating some cool digital tools that will be assisted tools to help Sahelis use the uh, e-commerce tool live as they're operating it. But there's a lot of innovation and space there, right? And, and we're really excited to like work with more uh, young students to think about innovation of what else can we do? Like, can we create videos? You know, should we do WhatsApp sessions? Like, what else can we do to make this thing happen? We are also in the middle uh, of, of having a conversation with an organization called LaborNet that does a lot of digital literacy skilling. And we're trying to create uh, a customized module of training with them and maybe seeing if they could actually become a virtual classroom for our cities. Right. So, um, again, we don't want to necessarily design everything ourselves because we don't believe we're experts in everything. So we're trying to really bring in other partners and ideas to make that happen. Um, Sahelis are not I mean, you have to recognize that Sahelis are not selling stuff that they're making themselves. Right. Sahelis are literally like imagine rural Amazon in India, which is high touch, high tech designed and curated for the rural customer. Right. And it's local branded products. It could be Samsung's, Philips, et cetera. It's products and services that are coming from um, outside rural villages that are coming into rural villages because rural customers are demanding, wanting access to the same quality products and services that other people have access to. So please understand that it would make no logical sense for a Saheli to sell those products in a city because they're available in the city already, 
right? The whole point over here is that they're available in the city and it's not fair that it's not available in rural villages, right? So if a rural customer wants to buy, right, um, a good madhani or a good brush cutter to be able to do their work in the field, right? It's not fair that Crompton doesn't have their product available in the village where this uh, farmer lives. And it's not fair that Crompton doesn't have an after sale service system that if God forbid something goes wrong with that product, that customer could service it within, the, within two days because Crompton doesn't believe in investing in shops and service centers where these villages are. That's what the Saheli and Frontier Markets is filling as a gap, right? Um, to apply to work for Frontier Markets, again, I mean, you know, um, I, I will share, in fact, let me share it in this group because I have it right here. Um, I'm sharing a link with everybody. Please read this article. And I, I, I really encourage you to read this article because this article tells you about the art of connecting and getting a job opportunity, right? Um, so um, it talks about a cover letter. It talks about doing your research about frontier markets. And it's about writing a thoughtful cover letter and then sending your resume and telling us why you're interested in working in the organization, right? So make sure you do your research, right? To understand what the organization is. Make sure that you are thinking about your passion, your areas of interest, but also your skills. And what would you be able to offer? You just had an opportunity of listening to the founder CEO of the organization that you want to apply to, right? For 45 minutes, right? Like, you know a lot more about the organization than a lot of other people do when they apply for a job because you're hearing it from literally the person who founded the company, right? So after hearing everything I just said, and I'm more than happy to share, Anjali, you can share the presentation with everybody on the call as well. Um, if you have access to this and you know what Frontier Markets wants to do, right, in the next couple of, in the next one year, two years, Think about that and think about where you would be able to contribute and what you would like to learn and how you would like to be involved, right? Don't just go, hi, ma'am, I love your organization. I want to apply for a job. Please choose me. Here's my generic resume, right? Don't do it. It's a really bad move, right? That's the easiest way that recruiters reject even looking at your application. Because remember, 122 million people lost their job and over 50 million people did not get placed this year, right? And please understand that context. So be better than that, right? Because you're getting a unique opportunity to get deeper insights as to what's going on. And that would be my biggest advice that I would say to you in terms of that. Um, so there's a lot more questions and I really appreciate it. And I don't know, I mean, I can stay for another 10 minutes, but Anjali and Aditi, you would have to tell me whether you guys have another session. So I don't wanna, you know, take time from other people's sessions, but, um, I see that, um, you know, uh, they, so a lot of questions are coming around. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, um, looking at, so Manita, I already answered your question, so I'm not going to answer it. I, I talked about where we're operating and I talked about where we're going to go. Um, I think the question that Prasenjit has in terms of, um, Smartphone usage, again, I kind of answered that question around digital literacy and where the challenges are and where the, where, the, where the work needs to happen to make it happen. It's not about, please understand, it's not about the end customer using the app. It's about a Saheli. Recognize what assisted e-commerce actually means, right? It's physically a woman helping someone use technology, right? And she's literally assisting their ability to place orders, right? So... Um, uh, and again, you guys can Google this information because there's a really clear presentation around that to help you understand that. Um, I'm looking at other questions. Um, which I started on teaching, teaching clothing. Okay. So I think the how can we help is a very uh, loaded thing, right? I mean, I think that, um, you know, uh, one thing I'll tell you right now is that um, this sounds strange for me to say because I'm an entrepreneur myself, but to be honest with you, um, I don't know like the age group that everyone's in. I don't know what kind of financial backups you guys have. I don't know whether you come from super privileged families. I don't know whether or not you were talking about starting companies or initiatives on your own and what kind of infrastructure you have. If you are not today 
coming from a super privileged family and have access to all the capital in the world, right? This is probably not the best time to start a company, right? COVID is a very tough time, right? There are market uncertainties, there are capital uncertainties. There's just a reality there. If you look at the amount of companies that are shutting down in terms of startups, or if you look at the amount of people that are trying to save themselves from liquidating, or if you're looking at the amount of people, so that where people are raising money are, or, are companies that have already been really well established and they already have an existing network of investors, right? Um, where companies are earning, uh, are, are, are setting up innovative ideas and being innovative is when they have already come from many years of working. They have a, their own network of people and they can easily get in touch with an incubator and accelerate and incubate an idea and take that idea because they got funding from the incubator and they were able to innovate on the idea and take that forward. Um, if you're not in that position right now and you are asking yourself that you want to set up a business or you want to help or you want to do something, honestly, my advice to you, and remember, an entrepreneur does not earn a salary, right? An entrepreneur gives out salaries. An entrepreneur risks their own capital first to kind of make business decisions, right? And a person that's supporting an NGO is not earning a salary. And if I'm hearing correctly from the questions that you guys are asking, I think the question maybe is a different question, right? The question is, what can we do at this time to be more impactful or be more uh, interactive or be more um, hands-on, right, into something? And I would say that this is the most incredible time to think through internships, fellowships, part-time offering, offer your talents to organizations that are solving problems right now. Offer your talent to learn about what is happening in this rapid changing time, right? COVID has created innovation and evolution overnight, right? Companies are partnering. Who thought Swiggy would sell groceries, right? Who thought Zomato would sell groceries? Who thought Amazon would start partnering with an Uber to kind of increase their ability to deliver things on the ground, right? Who thought that fintech companies, right, would actually partner with NGOs on the ground? None of us thought, who thought an NGO that's providing government services would suddenly want to partner with a social business like Frontier Markets? Everybody is innovating and changing and pivoting and designing right now because COVID is a very different period of time, right? And I think that if you guys are asking about what you can do or how you can get involved or what can happen, I think it's really important to start thinking about um, where you are today, what you want to do for the next three months, six months, nine months, 10 months, and what, how do you build yourself to be ready for whatever future you're looking to design yourself for, right? And ask yourself the tougher questions, right? Because these are really pragmatic questions that have to be answered. Because the question that you're asking about financial challenges, of course, there were many right? I mean, I was a self-starter, right? I started my company with literally like 10 lakhs in my bank account, which I earned after, which I, which was my savings after seven years of working in the microfinance sector, right? And I literally invested a hundred percent of that money in pilots. And then I struggled like crazy to try to get my first funder. And it took almost uh, an entire nine, nine or 10 months to get my first funder. And after I got my first funder, each time, you know, it takes a while, right, to establish your business, to get your learnings, to get your business going and raising the right amount of capital, getting your business running, hiring the right people. I mean, it's a lot of stuff. And each time there's always going to be different challenges that you have to face. So tackling it does mean that you have to be realistic and pragmatic about what you are trying to achieve. What are your backup plans and who can you build as a support structure? If you guys today are trying to make a name for yourself or get yourself entered into this community of entrepreneurship or get yourself into the community of impact and change or the role that you can play when it comes to data and innovation and rural India or e-commerce or technology, I would say use this time to actually partner with organizations that you think are interesting and exciting, right? Partner with the organization that is directly working on, you know, crafts, skills development and linking market markets, right? So the person that was asking the question about sewing kits, et cetera, there's a great organization called Industry, right? That does incredible work specifically on crafts areas, right? And maybe you should ask that question to someone like that, right? And think about where you can maybe help them and volunteer just so you can start learning more. Nothing will change your life more than 
learning by getting hands-on experience with organizations. And that is, I think, the most important takeaway that I could probably give to anybody, um, including anybody that's thinking about starting their own business, anybody that's thinking about what value they can create, anybody that's thinking about how they can participate. Um, so I think that um, uh, Anjali just sent a message, which is great. So um, I'm going to stop here. Um, and I'll just say that, you know, um, I really do appreciate the questions that came in. I think they were quite great. Um, Anjali and Aditi, if there are more questions that come in, feel free to email me and I'll try my very best to respond to them, maybe on email. But also I've shared my email, I've shared a link. And also, um, uh, like I said, you can share my um, PowerPoint. And I'm looking forward to being in touch. Best of luck and apologies to the next speaker. I'm over, um, uh, but I hope you have a great session. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining And it was wonderful to learn from you. Yeah, Great. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Ajayita, I am the next speaker. Hi, I'm Aarti. It was lovely hearing the, you know, I uh, came in some time in between, and it was fantastic. Uh, I think you said a lot of things, which has made me think, OK, what do I talk about now? So I hope the group has some extra questions for me. But no, it was fantastic hearing you, and uh, uh, all the best. Hello, ma'am. Yes, hi. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Aditi, and I'm going to be your host for this session. So our next speaker for today's session is Aarti Gupta, ma'am. Aarti Gupta, ma'am, co-founder of fashion tech startup StyleNook.in, is an entrepreneur who has been at the helm of a lot of cutting-edge startups, such as Sulekha.com, Rediff, Savan, Hopscotch.in, and now StyleNook. She's a computer science engineer and has completed her MBA from IIM Ahmedabad and is here today with us to share her thoughts on women entrepreneurs. Now I request ma'am to continue with her session. Uh, hi, thanks uh, Aditi uh, and hi everyone. Uh, I see everyone on mute, which I think makes sense uh, in terms of the session, but I personally like interactive sessions. So I have not brought a PowerPoint presentation. I have not brought like, you know, a lot of yarn to share. Uh, I think uh, since I understand most of you are still in college, still trying to figure out, you know, what the journey ahead looks like. This is a really good time to speak to entrepreneurs. So I'm glad that you guys have uh, invited people like Ajayta and me to, you know, speak about this. Uh, but I think for us also to make the most out of this session, it is best if we have more interactivity, some more questions, more specific questions. And I'll be very happy to ask some questions myself. So I would love to have some participation. I hope the group is looking for some participation. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to tell a little bit about myself, and then we can dive right in. Uh, so uh, like my introduction, uh, I am uh, you know, an engineer. I've done an MBA. And in my life, you know, I mean, if you ask me 20 years ago, and I graduated 20 years ago from uh, IIM Ahmedabad, and uh, 20 years ago, if you had asked me what was a career and what was a journey that I was looking ahead at, you know, I had certain benchmarks, I had certain, you know, uh, aspirations, and a lot of it was not based on what I really understood because I did not know that much about the world. I was quite young. I was raw i didn't come from like you know uh, i came from a very simple uh, middle class family so my ambition my aspiration was also uh, reflective of that uh, and i really wanted like you know that nice corporate job that's what was my aspiration i did not really know what that nice corporate job would mean uh, i think it meant a few things it meant uh, a good paycheck I think financial security for sure. It meant a good paycheck. It meant that, you know, a paycheck and uh, the kind of quality of work which should allow me to travel, which would, you know, let me, you know, hang out with whatever the big wigs of business be, uh, which would allow me to, uh, you know, just have my own journey. Uh, and it was very vague. And I, it's sounding vague because that's what it was. I really didn't have a very crystal clear idea of what life was going to be like. And I am assuming that uh, some of you might also have a similar situation. And all I want to say it is that, you know, it's absolutely fine to not have a very clear idea. 
uh, at 20, I really, you know, had no business knowing everything about the world. Uh, a lot of that happens as you go through your journey and as you go through your uh, life. So when I graduated from IIM Ahmedabad, I took up a job in luxury goods marketing with the Swatch Group. It is a very high profile placement from my campus. The job had all the, you know, uh, sheen that came attached to it. I was flying, you know, everywhere. I was, you know, doing some very big high profile events. I was planning marketing budgets, you know. Uh, it was a very interesting role. A lot of learning involved for somebody who was right out of business school. Uh, and then in 2002, I moved to the US at a very bad time in the economy. So, you know, just a little bit ago, Ajayta, when she talked about like, this is just an unprecedented time, uh, 2002 was also fairly unprecedented time in the US because it was right after 9-11. And nothing like that had happened in America for a long time. Uh, and right after 9-11, uh, the economy had crashed. The e-com uh, market had crashed or the dot-com market had crashed. It wasn't so much e-com as much as dot-com at that time. Uh, and suddenly there weren't enough jobs around. And so, you know, for somebody, you know, I, I was someone who was like a good performing student throughout my life. I'd never had to struggle for getting admission into places or getting job interviews or getting jobs at the end of the day. And suddenly I find my, found myself in a situation where there was just not enough jobs. Uh, and I was a very low priority candidate for most people because I did not have local experience. I did not have a local degree. Uh, and that kind of, you know, uh, adversity was actually very uh, grounding for me. And looking back, I mean, that time was a time of a lot of struggle. But when I look back, I actually feel that that's something that has actually helped me tremendously, you know, throughout my life. So. It, I say this specifically also because, you know, uh, because of COVID, because of the current scenario, there is an economic crash happening across the world. There is, you know, a true, uh, you know, unpredictable scenario that all of us are going through businesses, education institutions, families, everyone. We really don't have the ability to have very clear predictions what it is going to be in one year, in two years, in three years. Uh, we have some hypotheses, but nobody knows. Uh, and I'm just giving a personal experience here to tell you that very often not knowing everything is all right. Uh, I think what's important is how do you use that time well? So for me, what I did is uh, I did networking. And I did networking in a time and age when there was no social media. Uh, and so I left right and center, started reaching out to alumni, to friends, to family friends, to, you know, uh, just really like vague connections. This was happening in the time of email and phone calls. So just remember that there was no social media at that time. LinkedIn hadn't come through. Facebook hadn't come through. We had Yahoo Mail and Yahoo Messenger and Yahoo Groups. Uh, but actually that worked well because I started doing internships. And one thing led to the other. I got an internship with a company called Sulefa.com, which again was a startup, had not raised any money. And in my typical, you know, oh, I've graduated from a top school kind of attitude, I honestly would not have looked at a business like that typically because it wasn't a business that had raised a lot of money. It was definitely not, you know, very high profile. Like Greedif.com was. And, uh, but Suleika, nobody had heard of at that time. It was, uh, non-existent, you know, uh, small team. And I literally interned for them. I did not even get a job. I said, okay, let me just intern and figure out. But by interning for them, and I interned, like, you know, I had to, like, crush a lot of my ego. I was, uh, like I said, I graduated from, like, good schools with good, you know, prospects, and suddenly I was in this zone. Uh, so it was a very humbling experience for me. And uh, but by interning, I was able to do a few things right very quickly. It allowed me to understand, OK, what was this space all about this online space that was that had so much buzz? What did it mean? And I very quickly found that, OK, this is actually the uh, future. Uh, you know, this is how it is going to be. And I figured that, OK, this is a space I would like to be in. I also learned a lot about myself. What am I good at? What do I suck at? And I think it's very important to know that. Uh, and it's, it's a process. You don't suddenly know everything about yourself, right? As we all go through our life, we keep learning more and more uh, about ourselves as well. 
but uh, that experience at Suleika established to me that I also had the resilience and the grit that is quite needed at a startup. So very quickly, within a few months of me starting to intern, I got I was able to have been the founder CEO, my ex boss. He very quickly converted it into a full time position for me. I joined that company, and even as I joined it at that time, you know. Uh, thought was that okay great like finally i'm able to get a job let me get this job and then see what i can do and then what happened for me is the quality of work really pulled me in a startup actually more than any corporate job allows you to you know do a lot of things uh like ajayta said before me it allows you to go deep in many ways uh i was doing product i was doing marketing i was doing you know uh i, I literally was doing sales by driving uh, hundreds of miles to you know even collect small checks uh, and that was part of the you know learning experience which was quite inspiring for me so and like i said uh, very quickly i mean it was it brought my skill set to a level so quickly that you know other startups were actually uh, looking to hire me the economy had turned by then and so then my next hop was to readif.com and all my experience at suleka.com became very valuable to this company which actually was a large company it was a poster child of indian you know uh, dot com ecosystem uh, even though right now of course you know it doesn't hold uh, that kind of uh, uh, value anymore but uh, i then joined readif and that's a company again i built out their international business unit for uh, many years uh then i moved to savan.com because by being in this uh industry uh you just get to know a lot of people and savan when it was starting out we started like you know talking and engaging and when savan became b2c originally it used to be a b2b business when they went b2c basically when they launched the player uh they needed somebody uh to manage sales and marketing and i joined uh for that role and then in 2011 i moved back to india and uh again i was trying to figure out you know what do i want to do next uh and i was actually in the process of thinking about starting my own company i didn't done enough of the startup space that i knew that okay for me here's what i've learned about myself right that i'm a builder i enjoy building stuff i am not necessarily a big you know uh, as much as like i said my early parts of my career i may have had a lot of uh, aspiration for a corporate role but i've recognized that actually no uh, that holds less of a charm and for me to be able to actually build businesses and see them grow see them nourish see them flourish actually is very very exciting to me uh it calls for a lot of hard work it calls for a lot of grit which i have within me that's also something i've discovered about myself i am not a laid back person i may be easy going but i'm not laid back and i think there is a subtle difference in that and as an entrepreneur you know if you're too laid back you may not be able to write that business out so i was anyway move, i'd moved back to india i was thinking of starting my own business and then i uh, met the founders of this early stage um, e-commerce business called hopscotch touch in and uh, they needed somebody to come in uh, as you know head of marketing as a number 3 to the founders and i think it was a role made for me because by that time i had actually had a baby uh i was a young mother i'd been a young mother in the us i was a young mother in india and so my understanding hot scotch's uh, value, value proposition was to bring kids you know uh clothing toys and accessories to india the stuff that wasn't easily available to indian moms but it was very common to have it in uh india about 7 8 years ago or even 10 years ago my son is 10 years old uh the kind of merchandise that you got in india versus what you would get abroad was very very different in pricing and quality in you know variety and actually basically it sucked uh, you just didn't get enough like good stuff so the hot scotch value proposition was to get that uh for the uh, indian mom and the founders had you know street cred because they had both worked at diapers.com which is a very successful uh kids e-commerce business in the us and so they had brought that learning and they wanted to kind of you know uh, develop this market so i got on board with that idea uh had a really 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 exciting time building that business out right from ground up i was a ceo there and then i left about 5 years ago because i had had that thought that i needed to start something of my own and one of the things that i had learned through my hopscot journey or all the uh, earlier journeys as well right uh 
that if you are able to solve a very specific problem for your customers and if you are able to give them that strong relationship and bond you have customers with you for life uh and most e-commerce businesses in india are constantly trapped in a few different ways one is you know acquiring customers is expensive i think all of us see the instagram ads facebook ads now tiktok ads you see ads everywhere right uh the ads cost money and when uh but of course we click on those ads and we go to those sites and we make a transaction which means that that ad has converted which is wonderful except for if an ad converts into you know uh, if the cost of acquiring a customer let's just do some basic economics if the cost of acquiring a customer is say 1000 rupees who buys a product of 1200 rupees and your profit margin was you know maybe uh, 300 rupees or 500 rupees you've still lost money on that uh, and so if that customer doesn't become loyal and does not keep coming back to you again and again and each time you need to advertise to acquire that customer your business is never going to make profit and that is the case with most e-commerce businesses this is the reason why most e-commerce businesses just go down uh the cost of acquisition is high so if you're purely dependent on advertising that is a challenge uh and also if you're not able to do a higher average order value so that was a problem that at hopscotch uh i think we were able to solve very well uh the cost of advertising uh was relatively lower because there was a lot of word of mouth and uh more importantly we were able to get our customers to come again and again and again hopscotch became an addiction moms would come like you know several times a month uh buy you know several thousands worth of products <clears throat> excuse me and having learned from that i figured that one of the other bigger areas like i said about 10 years ago if you look in the kids space you know you didn't have enough merchandise uh in the fashion space you had merchandise but you don't have relevance uh you know uh, and fashion industry works like that fashion industry works in a way where uh you know you make a lot of assumptions designers come up with the latest collections and designs and then because you're not sure whether customers are going to like this or not you do a lot of push marketing you do a lot of like you know uh <clears throat> aspiration you en uh, enroll celebrities in the process uh but something which is very simple uh which is lost out in this process is asking the customer what they want and very often i mean it's easier to say that than done a customer may not always know what they want uh that is also one of the things about fashion shopping which is why people want to go out and see acha ke dekhte hai na mall mein kya hai uh it's a very standard you know uh thinking and that's because she doesn't want what she wants as a product but she knows a lot about us herself and i say she because style nook my uh company focuses for women but uh she knows very often that yeah i need something for summer it's a very vague you know idea now it comes down to understanding okay for her what does summer mean what is her taste what is her size what is her you know uh, her day to day life understanding her lifestyle because what summer clothing for me may be very different for somebody else who has a different lifestyle somebody who travels in a train versus who travels in a car you know again different lifestyle uh, and therefore different implications so style look for me was you know trying to take that understanding from the user directly applying it into a structure where algorithmically and with ai you can actually figure out a very strong recommendation engine most recommendation engines you would have seen recommendation engines on you know e-commerce sites amazon mintra wherever mostly they work on a few factors they work on what you've shopped before what you've browsed uh, there are recommendation engines which go above and beyond because they cookie you across the you know uh, your browser history and they will as make assumptions around this and the philosophy at stylno was let's stop making assumptions let's actually ask the customers who they are what they want what is it that you know how do they operate uh, and like i said going back earlier customers don't often know what they want because that's how you know uh, fashion is uh, but by knowing a deep history a rich history of the user you can actually start making recommendations you can also start developing very strong patterns uh when somebody has a certain taste preference because they're also a certain age a certain body shape 
you start seeing patterns that okay people of this nature tend to buy more of this and that's how the recommendation engine gets better and better and with that i think the larger thing was that machine learning is fantastic it's great it will also invariably always fail if you do not uh, validate it with human input so at style look what we do is with the machine learning there is also a human involved because the machine is learning from the human as well uh so at style look the way it works is you know our customers they come online they fill out a profile based on her profile uh, there is a stylist matching that happens there is a human stylist and algorithmically we figure out which is the best stylist because one stylist can do very good for one uh, customer and may not be able to do so well for another so stylist matching happens and then you know a customer typically comes and like i said you know the requests are a little vague and weird saying i need something for summer or i have a conference coming up and i would like a few looks uh and then the stylist who is a human can start thinking that okay this is somebody who is a certain age a certain uh, designation a certain role uh, we also have uh, proprietary ways of figuring out her you know nuanced tastes and preferences and accordingly the recommendations develop and the stylist job is then to see those recommendations say oh here are those two three outfits that i can pick for you it includes uh, clothing but also like it's an ensemble it's a look that you give the user because clothing sure everybody can buy but now the idea is how do i kind of complete a look for her and this is done with her budget in mind with her size in mind and size is very complicated especially for women it's not just size but it's also the shape uh somebody who is an s but has broader hips uh and somebody who is an s but has a you know broader shoulder line they may be the same size but the kind of styles that work for them are very different uh some of this can be done algorithmically but some of this is also done by the human and the machine learns from the human as well so that's been my business model uh covid times caused an instant stop but uh, we as a company have been agile and you know uh we've moved fast we've changed a lot of things around so we did actually do a lot of advisory Uh, and our customers were more than happy to pay for just pure advice we did not know this before covid happened and we explored very quickly uh test and learn is a very strong core philosophy of mine i think as a startup person i can be very honest that we may make assumptions and we may think this will work and then we have to put it out to test and try it out and then say okay this worked or this did not work uh so unless and until you test something out uh you will never know more importantly you need to do lots and lots and lots of tests there is no formula you can have hypotheses you can have strong uh, backing to your hypotheses but you always have to then kind of put it out there in a very scrappy way uh, because if you sit and develop like a very detailed product and you may not finally find a customer for it the product development work is useless so with that context uh, i'm going to open this up uh, for you know questions uh let me know uh if there are are there already questions here i see more for frontier markets okay no the last comment i see is from anjali asking please feel free to post your questions for rt ma'am no ma'am rt uh, i'm old i'm much older than all of you but please don't call me ma'am and make me feel it uh so yeah i would love to get some questions at this point okay i think success is very very relative so i don't know what do you mean by after all this success uh i've done some things well i have been successful in a lot of ways i don't uh deny that but you know there have also been a lot of failures uh success isn't you know uh, that straightforward or that easy and success ka definition also keeps changing no same definition can't exist uh what do i struggle with i struggle I mean right now covid is a very big struggle and I mean it's not struggle so much as it forces you to rethink about you know newer opportunities uh and you know so I used to live in the US for many years and one thing which I found very exciting about and especially I lived in New York uh for a while uh you know in America the world war 2 was a very hugely impacting event world war 1 was as well but world war 2 was more recent right and so on one hand there was a lot of uh, 
challenge a lot of deaths a lot of you know loss of wealth etc that happened i mean there was world war 1 and then there was the pandemic uh, you know the spanish flu and then there was uh, the dip- the great depression and then world war 2 so you imagine like you know they're doing back to back to back to back terrible times for that country and the world war 2 in that sense could have been a really defining point for like you know the com- country to just crash but actually what happened as a result of people going through so much adversity is people also became very resilient they became very hungry they became very you know uh, open to doing a bunch of new things and so if you see if you look back at the 50s and the 60s america really blossomed not just america europe did too by the way uh, japan did i mean after uh, hiroshima and nagasaki you know people thought japan would be wiped off the map and it was and i think sometimes just being your rock bottom is actually a good place to be in sense from rock bottom there's only one way to go and that's up and then there's no measurement of what that up is going to be that yardstick is up to you so uh, the struggle like i said in a startup right now is that yeah uh, covid has definitely brought us all to a fairly you know rough spot and like i said we've been agile we've been doing a lot of things but there is a lot of unpredictability but with the unpredictability i also see a lot of opportunity so i'm a very positive person i'm the kind of person who always sees the silver lining on clouds so for me uh, the struggle though is you know still to kind of maintain that focus uh, as an entrepreneur again uh, one thing that you do is you never work alone i'm not you know uh, the single uh, the independent performer kind of an entrepreneur i am a builder i'm building the company i'm building teams i'm you know onboarding people i'm training them i'm getting them to see my vision and work on delivering it so one of my big struggle areas has been finding the right kind of people and with right kind i don't just mean skills uh but at a startup you need more than skills you need the right you know dna uh and the startup dna is a little bit different it means people who can actually work in an unstructured environment but actually bring structure uh, unstructured environment doesn't mean a free for all uh, situation it actually means that people who are also able to kind of run with a little structure people who are ambitious but they're also humble uh that you know ambitious enough that okay let me try this let me try this let me try this but if that doesn't work out they also don't sit and you know blame others or you know they just humble saying okay great this didn't work out i screwed up let me now do the next better thing uh so finding that kind of you know talent pool uh and and for most startups you will see that when the talent pool comes together that's when businesses take off so finding that talent pool and training that has been definitely a challenge area for me uh I think that is the next question. What is the best part of being an entrepreneur? There are many great parts. Uh, I personally, like I said, I am a builder, so I love you know giving birth in that sense. Uh, and I think as an entrepreneur, you see that on a regular basis uh, because it's not like uh, for me the journey is okay. I did I do A to B, and then it's all good, and then we can all sit back and relax. You can never relax. from a to b then you're immediately looking for b to c b to c c to d like you're constantly kind of you know going through milestones and each milestone kind of calls for a new set of you know priorities a new set of initiatives and i i i personally am you know very excited about that that really excites me uh it also calls for a lot of you know uh hard work and i actually enjoy working hard uh there are times when people have called me a workaholic and i don't like that label too much i mean it's not so much about being workaholic it's just that when you're enjoying your work as much you will spend more time uh on it you will you know enjoy the putting out quality uh, outputs uh so from that point of view i think that piece of being an entrepreneur is quite exciting there are many parts of being an entrepreneur that i don't like which also i'm happy to talk about more questions Okay, am I allowed to ask some questions, Anjali or Aditi? I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. I would like to understand uh, what is it that you are thinking about your career. Give me a few thoughts, and then I'll kind of you know be able to develop on that. I'm going to turn my video off just for a little bit because I'm going to get up and turn on lights. But uh, while I do that, uh, why don't you just give yourself a little bit time to think and. Uh, 
tell me how are you thinking about your career what is it that you want like i said you know for me when i was uh, in college my thought was oh i'll get a nice corporate job with like a nice cushy you know uh, corner office etc and that was my ambition and i don't think there's anything wrong with that kind of an ambition so i'd love to hear what are your thoughts about what do you want from your career nobody yet why are you here why did you decide to attend this session i'd like to hear that sorry to interrupt you ma'am but uh, before we get to that there are still a few questions in chat can i just read it for you yeah please please i'm sorry i may have uh, i've only seen two have i missed out oh yes 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 yes, yes. sorry sorry yeah. sorry let me okay i read articles about okay. giants like facebook and google monopolizing the market especially when it comes to advertisements and throwing up search results it is quite true uh, see in the case of a uh, a content business which is what facebook and google are actually they're not even content business they're uh, network businesses uh you know there was a time uh, about mid 2000s uh, there was a lot of social media sites a lot of social media platforms there was myspace there was friendster there was hifi and it really came down to who would be the last person standing and that ended up being facebook uh and of course as time has gone forth uh, you know newer ideas have come up newer networks have come up uh, instagram came up but guess what facebook acquired it uh, whatsapp which is amazing and it is so powerful especially in the developing world guess what facebook acquired it so from that point of view there's definite monopolizing uh, and that definitely creates you know uh, limitations and which is why i constantly believe that if you are not always dependent on pure pending to attract your audience you have a better shot at this so if you kind of con compare things to say an offline business uh, typically location 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 is what is good for a uh, offline store because you think that in a good place people will come and so they'll see you and they'll walk in and you know that's great way to generate sales uh having said that have we not seen businesses which are in the middle of nowhere especially like you know restaurants pata nahi wo kahan pe goregaon ke kisi gali mein hai but the name and the fame is there so you will kind of figure out on how to go there and i think when you develop a product of that nature you automatically also de uh you know uh link yourself from having to just purely spend on advertising advertising spend will not go away but if it is the only way you are able to run the business you are in deep trouble uh so i think uh, in the indian startup market uh, how does it affect it affects depending on your philosophy if you have never been able to figure out a way of getting your target audience getting your product in front of customers without spending money on these platforms you'll definitely be in trouble see the good news is kya ho jata hai na for a lot of marketers and i'm a digital marketer you know uh, that's my core uh, skill I know that I need to get a certain number of orders, and I need to get a certain amount of traffic to my site to in order to get that orders. Uh, and so, how what is the easiest way to do that? Uh, there are difficult ways also to do it, right? Like, okay, I'm kind of you know going through uh, developing a certain uh, ecosystem. I'm putting out articles out there. I'm engaging with my users in online platforms, offline platform. All of it is slow. It takes time. It takes a lot of painful effort. versus let me swipe my credit card on facebook and voila overnight between instagram facebook and you know uh, any other marketing very quickly i have like a thousand users on my site or i have a 10000 users on my site some of them have converted it suddenly starts looking very easy and it is easy except for that it is also expensive so very quickly those costs start adding up and as a business your profitability starts going really you know in a, a bad direction so yeah i think uh, for indian startups or any startups for that matter high dependency on any of these monopolistic networks is not a great idea these networks are fantastic when you have to hit very large scale as a business you're already kind of you know doing great people already know about your brand people are probably searching for your brand uh because you've already established that you know uh credibility and then these channels can help you amplify your reach 
uh, and that's when you can also have a very strong negotiating power in terms of the uh, you know bid rate etc but otherwise if your pure dependency is on these uh, platforms and you are in a little bit of trouble how can we grow our network uh, and i'm assuming you think uh, when you say grow your network it's your professional network right yes aditi okay i'm just going to assume and correct me if i'm wrong but i'm assuming that you're just talking about your network attending this forum is a great step in the right direction uh putting yourself out there is what networking really calls for uh i i also know this and i've been working for uh, 20 years i also know this that a lot of people don't like the idea of networking kai to lagta hai ki are i have to do this it's not your natural instinct uh at a personal level for me networking has come very easily because i like people i'm an outgoing person i like going and meeting people and talking to people i'm also not very shy so obviously it has come easy to me and for a lot of people it doesn't come that easily you don't have to do it in a group setting you can also try and you know do one on one uh conversations you can also like you know definitely develop relationships one big thing i will uh, leave you with especially because of the stage that you are at right uh there are multiple ways of networking of course uh, you know when i was graduating and networking for any professional personal advancement was always kind of looking up to people saying can i get somebody to you know be my mentor help me guide me and all of those are fantastic things do that but keep networking with your peer group as well your peer group your friends even your juniors for that matter because uh, you know not all of us are going to be at entry level throughout our life uh, today when i'm 20 years into my career i have you know been able to reach out and like i said because i'm an outgoing person it was easy for me to develop a lot of relationships but those relationships are you know uh, very legit so when i started styling for example and because of my philosophy of not having to spend crazy amounts on marketing uh, and the styling target audience is the working women so i figured that the easiest way for me to break this you know uh, would be to go through any corporate uh, relationships guess what i mean i have you know friends and friends friends and people ex colleagues and you know different people here and there and i could just start reaching out and within people for, will support you people will help you if they find that you have a value proposition that makes sense you're not a salesy salesy person i think nobody likes a very hardcore you know used car salesman kind of approach if they think that hey listen what you are proposing is actually something that you know my friend will uh, benefit from let me just recommend so network up but network uh, parallel which is with your peers network down as well not everyone is capable of doing broad level networking so i wouldn't really recommend going and just like setting up linkedin connections and saying oh i'd like to be your uh, whatever you know connect etc uh you do have to start somewhere but don't go a little crazy uh but also make sure like you know you are in a class right make sure you find the ability to have some common connections with as many people as possible uh a lot of it may not be pure networking and you know networking also has to be done without always like placing a uh target or outcome that okay i go to this networking event and therefore i'll get like 20 business cards and therefore you know those 20 business cards will convert to whatever two job offers utna you know try not to be that uh, uh you know regimented about it it's more like okay let me go out and see what's out there but you set up once you're there just try and have as many conversations with as many people as possible of course we are right now in covid times and so you're obviously not going to go out there like physically which means great it's even better like you can do a lot online like i said this uh, platform today is a fantastic way of you know not only speaking to like you're listening to people like ajayta mew but also like you know some simple things right within the questions that you're reading you might find questions that resonate with you if you feel that hey keshav's question makes so much sense let me pick up the phone and call keshav and also understand what he's thinking about it chat talk reach out you know connect find some common ways to connect and i think uh, that's how you slowly expand your network you, it won't happen overnight it's a it's it's a cultivated thing uh anjali as you said you had been to the usa but returned to india and set up a business here so was that an easy decision as we often see people who set foot in foreign country hardly come back to india a uh, very good question uh 
I think different folks, different strokes. Uh, and there was a time when coming back to India would not have made any sense. Uh, in the sense, uh, I know of people uh, who have gone to the US, especially the ones who went in the 60s, 70s, 80s. The moment you left India and you went there and you started working there, you started earning a very different amount. You started enjoying a lifestyle, right? You like had a big home and several cars and access to, you know, uh, different things. Uh, it definitely was a very straightforward decision. You were never going to go back to India now. That lifestyle was just, you know, too radically uh, different. And unless you had a very, very, very compelling reason, you would not do that. So the number of people who would ever come back would be less than like 0.1%. I have no idea. I'm, I, I don't know these statistics. I'm just throwing it out there, but I'm fairly confident that may not be too far. Uh, since the two 90s, I think India also started opening up, you know, the economy, uh, liberalization made a big difference to the kind of opportunities that came up in India. So I've also known of people who in that sense went to the US for short term stints. They may have gone for two, three years, come back and then continue to be here. It wasn't that uncommon. Again, it wasn't common either. And maybe one of the reasons why people would also come back is that US may have opportunity to say work out, etc. What changed the game uh, for India uh, was in, around the 2008, you know, that India shining campaign that we had. But forget the campaign in general, right? What India has been doing is India has had a very young population, a growing, you know, uh, penetration of internet. It's a market that has a lot of opportunity. Uh, dekho, you know, especially if you lived in the US, right, where you suddenly got used to a lot of convenience and systems. And when I would come back to India, everywhere I would look, I would find, oh my God, this is like, you know, like I said, the, whether it was a kid's shopping space or women's fashion or transportation or, you know, groceries or anything, everywhere you look, you saw problems. And as a builder, the idea is like, oh my God, a problem is also an opportunity. And an opportunity in a country like ours, which is uh, young in population, which is growing, uh, is very attractive. So the ability to think about, you know, developing a business model over here was personally quite attractive to me from that front. I've worked in startups in the US as well. Uh, and, you know, uh, I've, I mean, US is still like one of the best countries in the world to start a business in. I will not deny that because uh, there is a lot of uh, maturity in that market uh, in the investor space as well, which India doesn't have. Uh, at the same time, you know, your competition is very high. Your um, entry barriers are much higher because of the cost structure. India is also relatively low cost in a lot of ways. You can be creative, you can be smart, and you can set up like, you know, your business. So you get the ability to experiment cheaper. So that for me was quite attractive. And that was one of the reasons to, you know, come back to India at a personal level. Uh, so I'm married and my husband and I both, had never in that sense, uh, we were very happy with our life in the US. So it's not like we had any challenges, which is why we thought that, okay, it might be better in India. Uh, we were doing quite well, but we also had never kind of thought of our life there as a permanence. We'd always thought that, okay, we may at some point go back to India. So when the opportunity came, it wasn't difficult for us to do that at all. Next question is from Keshav Srivastava. Does your experience at IIM has impacted your startup? Did your experience? Okay. Uh, I hold a lot of value to my experience at IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, has it impacted my startup, this one or the one before or that one, etc.? cetera? I'll, I'll say it in a different context. What I learned at IIM Ahmedabad, honestly speaking, uh, I will say something which is a little... Uh, uh, almost controversial, but I do not think I learned a lot at IIM Ahmedabad. And when I say that, hear me out, bear with me. Uh, I went to uh, do the MBA program right after engineering. Uh, if I look back and if I had to change a few things in my life, I would work for at least four or five years before doing an MBA. Uh, the program at IIM Ahmedabad is stellar. And uh, I think it is one of the best things I have, you know, done uh, for myself in my life. But I think I would have taken a lot more 
value from that program had i already had a little bit experience under my belt uh had i had a little bit more personal and professional maturity it's not like i was you know being a hooligan over there or i was not behaving immaturely but I, what i'm trying to say is that you know you don't know enough about you know a lot of things and that's okay i think even in a startup like it's a great example in that sense so like for example when i started style no uh i obviously didn't know everything as an entrepreneur uh but i know some things uh i'm good at online marketing i am really good at running operations i am very strong on process i'm very very good at uh you know uh doing the startup experiments so i have a lot of things weighted in my favor i also didn't know a lot of things i did not know uh, a lot of the legal and the compliance and all of that really wears me down i'll be very honest that is a part of an entrepreneur's journey that i do not enjoy but the amount of time i spend doing administrative and legal and compliance work it's just it feels like a waste of time that it is important right the uh, uh, financial and the administrative health of your company is also very important but those are my weak areas and they're not my you know uh, i i don't get excited by them i don't like oh my god i'm going to excel at this i don't uh but because i have so many things that i'm good at it it's okay for me to also then kind of you know find things that i'm not so good at so going to business school with some experience that's what it does for you right you will at least arrive with a few things that you know you it's a market that you have studied uh you know a company that you have been a part of or multiple companies that you've been parts of functions that you have grown and you've learned you've gotten promoted you've had you know i mean organizational behavior is a very important aspect of your career right so you've had some conflicts some differences of opinion you've learned to kind of you know uh, find your way around that and so when you come to the program you actually take a lot more from it uh so from that point of view uh, that's my uh, personal input to everyone i mean uh, if you can it would be good to kind of you know uh, get a few years of experience how has it impacted my startup again when i went to imm the but i graduated in 2000 and the way we run startups these days is nothing from that program that could have impacted there are some really important things that i carried i think uh, i am the person has a very 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 strong focus on analytical rigor uh, number crunching and just being on top of your you know uh, being very analytical uh, and that i think has stood me well throughout my life not just at this startup but in general uh, i also learned uh, i am the bath had a very very strong written communication program as well and i think that continues to hold me you know well uh, and it, it that's a, that's a life skill it's not even for a startup or it, it could be anywhere it is even in your personal relationships if you are a good communicator you can go a long way uh, in putting your point across so i think there are some of those things uh, i think the biggest take away for me is of course the network uh, in a program like that you also get people who are you know uh in the long term they go into different you know areas and businesses i have now uh seniors juniors my peers who are uh very uh you know uh well positioned in different sectors so whether i need help for anything whether it's funding whether it's you know uh, any strategic uh, inputs whether it's partnerships i literally have the ability to pick up the phone and make calls because of part of that network uh, so that network is very powerful and that's definitely something that continues to impact my startup on a daily basis how long did it take for you to start style look after my mba 20 years <laughs> so i'm not a young entrepreneur uh, and the reason it took me 20 years is uh, well not 20 years sorry let me rephrase that uh, 16 years i uh, or 17 years i started style look uh, style look launched in 2017 uh i you know uh, like i said i i did not start out with ambitions of starting my own company i didn't come from that kind of background i don't come from a business family i didn't really have a sense of what it takes i was also risk averse coming from you know a middle class family you tend to be risk averse right you uh, and and i think it's very important for you to understand that while there can be glamour it always sounds very exciting to be an entrepreneur remember i think i listened into ajay and something she said was quite interesting because as an entrepreneur remember that you're not uh, you know going to make money in the short term 
in the long term you will make financial uh, you know uh, you will have that possibility possibility of making a big financial gain but in the short term it's not going to you know uh, make money so for me for somebody who did not come with that kind of safety net it would it took me a while to you know even earn enough save enough get enough experience to feel confident that okay if i take a financial risk i will not have a problem if i can do this for a few years and not earn you know a steady income uh and i can survive that uh i would not have been able to do that in the early part of my career i did not have a safety net i did not have family wealth or like you know any other prospects to fall back upon so for me it was important that i use that time to learn to earn to get relevant experience and uh I could have started a business of my own a little bit sooner as well. I was quite ready to do it by you know 2011, 2012. Uh, but yeah, it's just uh, the way that happened. Uh, I am 19 right now. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but at this stage, I feel very naive when I feel like I don't know anything about setting up a startup. Could you please tell me the way I could, any way I could improve myself and bring more value to my career? I think it's a brilliant question, Shruti. And at 19, I think uh, when you say you always wanted to be an entrepreneur, I think you're also operating from a gut feel, right? Uh, because that's what it could be. Uh, and the feeling that you think that you're feeling naive and that you don't know anything. Let me assure you, I'm 43 years old, and on a regular basis, I feel naive about some things. So, don't hold that uh, against yourself. Uh, I, I don't feel naive about everything. Of course, there is uh, value to all the you know uh, years and experience that I have behind me. But at 19, you're obviously going to feel like that. When you say you feel like you know strongly about being an entrepreneur, uh, I'm reading that you know again that's the gut instinct, and I think gut instincts are very powerful. They're very meaningful also. Uh, it's important though to sit back and examine like what part of entrepreneurship is exciting for you because there are multiple facets. Uh, one is of course. creating wealth right like by being an entrepreneur by running a business i will make it a nice successful venture i will have enough money now entrepreneurship is also of different natures one could be a uh, you know a very scalable business and you could be an entrepreneur like mark zuckerberg who oh my god like he's you know uh, just minted money through uh, facebook or uh, you could also be an entrepreneur who literally has you know one outlet or one store or something and just does that is their own boss is very happy about not having a boss to report to just happy that you're able to bring money home without any hassle and any drama and uh, just enough money that you are happy and you're able to maintain a certain lifestyle and that's good enough for you and there is a whole spectrum somewhere in between i'm somewhere in between right i'm not mark zuckerberg and i'm not like somebody who's just happy running one uh, tiny business uh so i think it's important to kind of examine like you know do a little bit more uh deep diving into that instinct because instincts are important instincts often guide us very well uh learning to say yes and no to a few things just from your what's your first gut instinct is actually quite helpful because your instincts don't develop overnight they develop as a uh, they're a accumulative part of all your experiences a little 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 experiences that you've had through your life and sure you're all of 19 years old so you still have a very long life ahead of you but that instinct it's important to examine that what part of it like you know uh, is kind of driving you to be an entrepreneur uh you don't know anything about setting up a startup trust me uh, until 4 years ago i didn't know anything either and uh part of me feels that i really wish i didn't have to know it either because setting up and so i think there are two parts it one is setting up a business which is a business model and that i think i was okay with but uh like a pain point a big sore point for me has just been the you know legal and the you know the compliance and the uh, all the board resolutions and this and that and it's a lot of i i feel like you know it just really drags me down so uh, and i didn't know and i continue just today i was told by my ca that there was some form that i was supposed to fill out which I haven't filled out, and I was going back and looking through documents to find what that form is. That aspect of you know uh, setting up uh, is not very exciting for me. Uh, but yeah, there are some things that you need to know about, and so I think again, your business goals can really come down from what is it that exciting to you. 
are you also there are entrepreneurs who are you know independent uh, operators and that's great for them they I, i know of a lot of people who are into things like training in you know uh, who have speaker uh, roles and they don't have to work with teams they don't have to work with anyone they just have to work with themselves it's really easy it's really straightforward uh, they don't have to kind of you know manage people they don't have to plan they can decide that okay these three months i'm going to take off and they can just absolutely take that time off and that works for them so you know it's very uh, i wouldn't say there is one uh, formula for everything i'm more than happy to chat with any of you by the way about you know any specific questions uh, that you may have so i'm also going to put my email address here and feel free to write to me uh, i will also reiterate what ajayta uh, ajayta said i think uh, when you write to me uh, try and make it a little bit more crisp so that you know uh, i'll be able to respond to it with a little bit like you know uh, more uh, depth because otherwise i might just you know not have the ability to give you a uh, uh, very like you know useful insight so right i am a good reader i can read long stories try to keep them um, sharp so i don't mind reading a long uh, statement but i do mind if it's jumbled up and it's not very clear so spend time focus reiterate uh, rewrite it a few times send it to me i'll be more than happy to respond at a personal level as well uh more questions Okay, I'll be looking at more questions. I think I had started asking a question uh, about why are you here. Uh, I would love to hear, like you know, uh, I think I see twenty six people in this room, and what is keeping you here? Why did you decide that on a Tuesday evening at seven p.m. instead of you know stepping away and doing whatever else you could be doing? Why are you in this room? be drinking coffee you could be watching tv you could be doing something else so something is definitely keeping you here uh if you can help me with that i'm going to be able to develop a little bit more on that conversation so no one knows why you are here shruti kuekar why don't you tell me why you are here what is it that you would like to learn um uh, from this session excellent question you would like to learn about my uh, journey from a computer science engineering student to an iim student fantastic question so you know i come from a generation where uh, you did a few things you when you you when you're a good student when you scored good marks you went into medicine or engineering or if you came from a commerce background then you went on and became a ca that's what used to be a formula uh looking back it was a rubbish formula but it is what it was uh and i didn't know any better and like i said i come from a middle class family my family didn't know any better so i didn't have too much of guidance uh it was literally as simple as i went to vjti mumbai and so i had the scores i actually had really good scores in bio as well and a lot of people question me why didn't you apply to you know mbbs uh and i look back and think about it that okay three extra marks in or uh, whatever not three it was i think one extra mark in biology versus you know mathematics can make such a big life difference i mean you know career difference so i'm really glad i didn't follow that advice because i had scored higher in biology than in mathematics and i'm really glad that at least i didn't follow biology i mean uh, nothing against biology I actually loved the subject but i don't think mbbs is the kind of journey that would have made sense for me uh, and i really literally went into computer science engineering because i got admission into computer science engineering so it's really not a very inspiring uh, story that way uh, had i known more better etc what would i have picked i actually uh, going back to the earlier question about gut instinct my instinct was to uh, pick up uh, you know a liberal arts program now a liberal arts program has no guarantees of a good placement and salaries etc so clearly that was never going to pass muster you know with my uh, dad 
and so uh, a compromise was struck my other choice was architecture and so compromise was struck and somehow then therefore i went into engineering so it's not a very good reason uh my transition from uh, so that's what i figured the four years of engineering i did all right uh and computer science thankfully so it was a little bit more invigorating um when i uh, was uh, in my third year my second year third year and i saw my you know peers around me starting to think about the next steps right so a lot of people were starting to prep for gre uh and uh, I think there was one thing that kept me from prepping from GRE, and again, the, the two reasons. One was just literally following gut instinct. That going and doing another master's program, it didn't feel like, "Yar, ye to nahi karna," hai, because then I'll just literally get trapped, trapped into sitting and doing this coding role. And I'm an outgoing person. I, you know, I always thought of my career as something where I would be going out, meeting a lot of people, etc. So hiding behind a computer screen and coding. was never like super exciting for me uh and so to do two more years of something that i'd already kind of you know not been too thrilled about doing in engineering it didn't excite me at all uh second decision for me in that sense was much easier also because like i said coming from a middle class family going abroad for a program which me meant uh higher fees and additional kind of you know uh investments so at that point i wasn't uh, too keen i so i instinctively went towards uh preparing for cat and uh, that's how i uh, you know i got through to uh, uh, in fact in, before i got through to i am and the other also got into to uh, calcutta and bangalore and i had to kind of think about what to pick and then when ahmedabad happened the decision became clear because i had also visited the campus and i really 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 like you know uh, got excited about it and from as a student who comes from bombay university i will tell you one thing um and i don't think too many things have changed it's been more than 20 years since i graduated and i don't think too many things have changed but uh, a program like an iit or rim is you know structured in a very very different way there is a lot of autonomy there's a lot of self learning there's a lot of ind- uh, independence and discipline that comes as a part of that program so there's a lot of rigor uh my engineering experience in mumbai was you know it was good enough i was doing like you know getting those right marks and getting the right scores i didn't really feel i was learning that much and there wasn't even a process that allowed me to learn that much there was a process that allowed me to pass exams and to get marks and which is you know barely you know uh, i mean for example the structure at imm the but um, most courses the contribution of uh tests and exams would only be like 25% or 30% uh the way the you know uh, uh, uh scoring was broken up a lot of it was class participation which means when you went to class you had to come prepared and you had to be participating in a conversation so that actually put a lot of onus on you as an individual to develop a lot of my development happened through that so uh as a transition it was really rough very 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 tough for a uh, mumbai university student to kind of you know go into that program uh, but it's baptism by fire uh, something like that has then also prepared me for the rest of my life that you know i don't get easily uh, faced by challenges uh, those two years they were very difficult but they were also really really critical i also found uh, the competition was there but it was in a um, in a very collaborative mode i actually uh, because we weren't com- competing only on one factor there were so many factors on which you were competing and you had to be good at something right not not everybody is good at everything so one person would be very good at project work another would be very good at you know uh, just individual work somebody would be very good at number crunching someone would be very good at writing and each of us i think each of those skills are very important in life and that's what you will find like you know as you kind of go through your career there is no one skill that is critical uh it's a balance of these skills and some you're very good at and some you're not so good at uh so the ability to collaborate uh in those kind of uh structures was actually very very uh inspiring for me uh but it was absolutely challenging it's very very different from your you know uh, typical university structures more questions Okay, I think there is more. 
from being a non commerce background did mb pursuing mb turn out to be a challenge as in were you able to cope up with the other students okay uh, shruti i think another good question uh, you know an mba in that sense is an all rounded program uh, so a commerce student definitely has advantages especially in certain courses of finance and uh, you know accounting because they've done that for the first 3 years uh at the same time they may not have the ability to do some of the other things so there are also courses in operations there are courses in you know uh and then there is ob and hr and those kind of courses where it doesn't matter in fact one of the things we found is uh some like so a program like i am in the bad actually is again nothing like university programs so uh you would learn in university in commerce for example to uh, prepare a balance sheet or a state uh, you know financial statement and an mba it's not just about preparing it's about analyzing it's about reading it and understanding and making management decisions on the basis of those numbers so uh, preparing it takes a little learning uh, it was never one of my favorite courses uh, but at the same time a lot of it is ultimately business driven and uh, i think as engineers we also tend to be uh, we have critical thinking engineering builds that right that little bit of logical critical thinking and that actually also comes to a huge advantage in fact uh, most people uh, in my batch or across batches when i hear these stories often uh, say that engineers have an advantage and i will tend to agree i think engineers in general tend to have advantage in a lot of other ways as well so uh i was was i able to cope up with the other students no uh because coping up takes a lot uh but yeah i didn't completely wither either i could kind of you know i mean it was a struggle it was a challenge and it it it, it was a tough two years but two best years of my life as well so tough does not mean bad a tough can actually also be very good i think that's also part of the you know entrepreneurial spirit right uh, entrepreneurial journeys are tough uh but they're not bad they're actually you know they invigorate you they uh make you come alive so in that sense uh, yes it was uh, challenging but uh, in a good way is an mba or any <clears throat> other business degree program is required to become an entrepreneur is a fantastic question uh most mba programs will actually not train you to be an entrepreneur uh i guess stanford is the only one which actually has a you know very clear positioning as an entrepreneurial school and that's also probably because of the proximity to silicon valley uh but otherwise most mba programs for two reasons i think both these are yeah. uh one is uh, mba programs are expensive and because they're expensive entrepreneurship is also expensive so typically back to back you can't do both unless you come from like you know a lot of wealth you have zero financial constraints uh typically when you do an mba program you've already kind of you know put out a lot of money and time and effort and energy and all of that and so therefore <clears throat> in most immediately you won't be able to think about entrepreneurship through the course of your journey uh does an mba program help in entrepreneurship 100% Uh, i think i have benefited immensely uh if i had not done an mba like i said you know my instinct was to go to as liberal arts uh and i would have probably done okay and well in that but had i been an entrepreneur with that kind of an educational training i think i would have had more challenges and more struggles an mba is definitely an all rounded program in that sense uh a good mba huh? by the way because i think there's just all kinds of mbas also being you know handed out and uh then it again becomes pointless it's an expensive exercise so i often give this advice to a lot of people that uh wait it out especially for mbas don't take admissions from you know poor quality schools just because you didn't get admission this year if you truly want to do an mba wait it out work harder next year apply again get to a better school a good curriculum good program i think it it's a lifetime you know investment that you're making do not be in a hurry to get an mba just to you know uh, get that uh, check box very often i think parents uh, dissuade saying ek saal waste hota hai ga koi waste nahi hoga kuch nahi hoga sab kuch theek ho jayega do not go to a poor quality school just because you know to get that thappa 
uh, in the long run it doesn't hold good so work harder get into a better school uh, you know you'll see the benefit also uh, it's not just the school curriculum the teachers your peer group right i mean a good school means you're also with a better peer group uh, and peer learning is very critical in general in the business school program as well uh you will also have the benefit of better placements uh so there's just you know it's a series it's a full order uh, so it is worth kind of you know working hard and getting into the right schools uh and the mba program for me definitely has been helpful in my entrepreneurial journey what would be the one advice you could give all students who are confused with their careers especially after bachelors or to those students who are willing to be an entrepreneur but where to start from thank you akshay it's a great question uh you know at a personal level i feel uh, and i know of entrepreneurs who have actually started right after graduation and they've actually done all right uh some of them have done well also so i'm not going to take away from that but uh i personally feel that getting a little bit work experience is critical uh just like i said for an mba also having some work experience is useful uh same thing for an entrepreneurship learn see your 20s are very valuable years those are the years where you have the luxury of making mistakes of you know trying a whole lot of new things and you also don't have the you know uh constraints in terms of you know having to uh raise a family or uh you know also financial responsibilities are relatively lower uh when you are in your 20s hopefully your parents are at a stage where they are still like you know they don't need that much caring you yourself are like you know independent and young so you have the luxury of that very clutter free time in your life don't clutter your life that is the other thing i will give as an advice to a lot of young kids uh and i think do not clutter your life with rubbish things have hobbies have friends have all of that but try and like keep your life clutter free because you know clutter can be distracting jumping from one thing to the other to the other to the other to the other it is very exhausting and your brain can only like you know do so much so for a lot of people the ones who are really successful in work i notice that you know they're able to do that when they're able to focus and one way to have deep focus is to be able to have fewer things to worry about in your life so i think your 20s uh are full of confusion and that confusion is very valid legit do not worry about it uh the thing to kind of do well in your 20s is uh pick up roles pick up you know uh jobs where you're learning a lot where you're contributing uh don't do a job like okay i go i i'm told what i'm supposed to do and i finish it and i go away or i sit and like you know chat with my friends or i make friends at work please make friends at work i wouldn't uh, do that but your workplace do not treat it like college it's not college canteen it is ultimately a, a place of you know a professional uh, working so give it that respect uh, because it's also your opportunity to learn a lot and if you find that you're not learning a lot have conversations with your managers do not hesitate walk up to your managers have this conversation saying uh, you know i am going from a to z i feel that i'm doing the same thing repetitively and i feel like i need to you know improve on certain areas ask for that feedback do not worry about getting negative feedback in your 20s you can get all the negative feedback in the world and no one's going to hold it against you uh it's a different story when you're in your 30s and your 40s i mean at that time people will kind of hold it against you as well but in your 20s you know you are everyone knows that you are young and you're you know uh starting out so you will get a lot of that benefit of doubt use it well uh if you're confused about entrepreneurship i mean if you're truly compelled to be an entrepreneur go ahead and do it i'm never going to say no to anyone but think about why what is it that core reason that you're kind of you know uh, inspired to do that is there a unique idea that you have and that you feel uh, I, i also say this all the time ideas are cheap uh, people have ideas all the time i have 10 new ideas on a daily basis so it's all about the execution uh, if you have an idea do you have the ability to execute do you have the ability to execute and finance that you know execution plan uh, if you don't have the ability to finance personally do you have the ability to raise finances 
will you raise it from you know friends and family will you raise it from uh, external funding do you recognize what the challenges will be once you have external funding in place because you're also inviting other board members into your company so it's far more complex than just you know wanting to be an entrepreneur uh, so i would actually go to the white board and literally think what okay why do i want to be an entrepreneur what about entrepreneurship is you know exciting to me uh, i because i have worked at startups myself i felt that that was a second best way of learning uh, by being in early stage startups i kind of got very like you know a uh, first row exposure to uh, the growth parts of startups and i got to learn a lot uh, without having the same risk as the entrepreneur entrepreneur definitely has a lot more risk at the end of the day so working at early stage startups is a great idea i think uh, one of the myths in india also and that's you know also when your uber and your flipkarts and your uh, amazons offer these very high big packages i think flyro has done that too uh, and so a lot of people also uh, have i've seen that they associate startup with these places which are fun and creative and exciting but also full of perks and luxuries uh, i mean you, there is room for course correction there uh, some companies which especially the ones which get funded very heavily will have the ability to throw some money don't get distracted by that uh money or no money and a lot of good startups will actually require you to take some uh, haircuts uh, uh like start working there at lower salaries uh don't take that as any personal you know insult it's actually not a bad thing at all uh because if that company is able to manage its finances well and you are able to grow with the company eventually your salary will you know adjust in fact you'll do better than your peers but uh, be in a place where you actually have the ability to grow with the company. more questions or are we looking at towards the end yeah i think that's all with the questions thank you so much ma'am for joining us there is so much to learn from your journey and i think everyone present here today would take something from you and your journey cool i am glad uh, like i mentioned i have shared my email address uh, reach out to me uh, be specific with your questions i'll be more than happy to you know uh, respond to them maybe not immediately but i always kind of within a week's time try and respond uh, especially if i don't see something very urgent i may not respond immediately but i will respond so that much i can promise you uh, one thing you know i will uh, leave you with is uh, to not be worried about confusion i think it is very natural even today i still on a daily basis have this you know retrospective thinking that okay is this the right thing to do is this not the right thing to do i don't have enough information so the only way to kind of you know work with that confusion is to empower yourself with more knowledge and more education read up more uh read 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 there is no you know uh there is no alternative to that because answers will not come to you packaged uh, and very very often especially at your point right they some people will try to package those answers for you saying you know here you go this is a great program ta 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 you will get this and just put down whatever you know be very mindful about spending your parents hard earned money in some programs which may or may not be as good so a lot of uh, good education programs are out there but a lot of them are very substandard uh be very mindful of not you know uh, doing that in fact invest that time in you know uh, freelancing working whether it's a startup whether it's a large scale company do that because on the job learning is actually always going to be far more powerful i often find uh, you know uh, i've seen this that we've uh, interviewed and hired an intern and then later the intern does not join because they decided to go and pursue a course and very often i find that the course that they're trying to pursue is actually a very mediocre course not only is it mediocre but it's also an expensive course so you know the parents are shelling out lakhs of rupees for a course thinking that oh my child is learning uh and actually the opposite is happening the child is actually not learning too much in that course they're doing whatever some check box things of course they will do uh 
but on the job learning is actually really really valuable if you have family businesses get involved uh, if you have you know the ability to uh, learn from whatever context network do it uh, do it through jobs do it through the uh, network but there is no honestly uh, no replacement to you know on the job learning so i'll just leave you with that thought uh, do not hurry into especially into expensive you know programs i like because i do digital marketing and i interview for that role very often i find so many uh, you know people who have come they've done some three month course they've happily you know paid a lot of money and when i look at their learning it's zero it's zero it's as good as zero running your own social media is not the same as you know running digital marketing very different uh, ball game uh, but because these courses will you know teach you the high level frameworks and they will leave you with that and that's not necessarily going to be enough for you to be uh, proactive or to be uh, well performing it also here's what it does right any course that has now you've invested your time and money in you feel entitled to therefore go and do a job which will pay you well enough to justify that and uh, sometimes you know the course may not have taught you enough to take very like you know uh, top jobs so try and not get distracted by that i think most of your engineering students so maybe that question does not even exist um, but if it does i mean just be very careful i fully advocate a good mba program uh, but i also will be very mindful and say that okay if it's not a great program don't do it same thing for a masters if you are thinking of a masters in the us try and do it from the good schools uh, i think it's going to get very complicated now with the whole covid thing i don't know how that's going to work out uh, but maybe there is distance learning also that will come into play which is not the same thing because then you know uh, a large part of doing any program is also again cultivating your network right making meeting your classmates meeting your faculty uh, connecting with them and that may not be possible if you are uh, um remote so but regardless of like you know any of these decisions you make keep those things in mind uh, try not to hurry into something which you know uh, may or may not give you the desired results so cool that's what i shall leave you all with thank you so much for having me here and it was i had some really good questions so i enjoyed the session uh, feel free to reach out to me and i will uh, be available so thanks aditi thanks anjali i think we are ready to drop off is that right I shall be signing off. I think Aditi, you had dropped off, and I was saying my goodbyes. Yeah, I'm so sorry. No problem. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And I would also like to thank our audience, and we hope to see you tomorrow for our upcoming webinars.